what I do. Amen. We thank God for being in this place uh, on this evening. I know that we've got a lot of folks out tonight, a lot of folks sick tonight. And I'm going to pray that they just keep it right where they are. <laughs> amen. I will share in tribulation, but there are some things I will not share in. Amen. And I don't want to share in your germs or your viruses or anything else. So, But we're going to pray for them. My mom has been sick now for like two weeks. And we need to pray for her that God would just touch and heal her. She went to the doctor today and they said, this virus is going around. Sometimes it just hangs on. Uh, Sister Shonda's daughter has been equally sick. Uh, so we want to pray for her as well. Um, but we've got a lot of folks. I know Lydia's out sick now tonight. Um, I'm trying to, I don't see Sister Leslie. Maybe she's running late, but she could be sick tonight. I don't know. But we got a lot of folks out. So let's pray and ask God to touch those who are sick. I know that we should have a, uh, quite a contingent of people watching us on live stream tonight. Um, but let's just pray that God would touch them and help them and heal them. And then pray for the service tonight that God would bless us in a mighty way and help us and speak to our hearts and our minds. And uh, we want to continue to remember uh, Victoria and Braxton in our prayers that God would just perform a miracle in that thing and uh, show himself strong as I know that he will. Uh, but otherwise, let's just go before the Lord with thanksgiving. Amen. His courts with praise. Be thankful unto him. Bless his name. And uh, I know that God will have something special for us today. Father, we thank you so much. We are so grateful, Lord, for this honor and opportunity we have to be in your house tonight. Lord, we just love you and we praise you. We honor you and we thank you. And, Lord, we're so grateful that your word, God, even deals with situations like tonight, God, where two or three are gathered in your name. You're in the midst of us. And, Lord, we have more than that tonight. So we believe that you're going to be in the midst of us moving and speaking and healing and delivering and helping and encouraging, challenging, correcting, and changing, God. Speak truth in this house, God, that will save our souls, oh God. Speak truth into our hearts, God, that will change our minds, God. Speak truth, oh God, tonight, Lord, that will cause us, oh God, to draw closer to you. Oh Lord, help us, oh God, for we have come in here to worship you, and we thank you for the place, we thank you for the moment, and we thank you for the opportunity to come into your presence, Lord, because you are great and greatly to be praised. You are worthy of glory and honor, oh God. Oh, hallelujah, Lord, tonight. Hallelujah to your precious name. Hallelujah, Lord God. Oh, we worship you, Lord. Touch our sick tonight, Lord. We'll pray for them again at the end, but Lord, even now, Lord, go, oh God, and send your word, God, into their homes, God, for we know that by your stripes we are healed, oh Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus, Lord. Meet us tonight, Lord, and we'll give you praise and glory in honor for all of it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Let's worship the Lord tonight, saints.
Thank you.
Hallelujah. How many of y'all are glad to be chosen in God? Amen. All right, you young people can go. Amen. The rest of y'all got to stay. Amen. Sister Leslie will probably preach better than me tonight, so. Amen. You could be seated in the presence of the Lord. Oh, we thank God for his presence. We thank God for his anointing. Amen. Oh, dear God. Well, it's kind of nice when you dismiss the youth and the church empties out, I guess. I don't know. But it is so good to be in the house of God uh, on tonight. And I, I, I want to preface what I'm about to say. Um, I, I, I was going to talk a little bit more about families uh, and, 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 and how they work tonight. Um, but the Lord gave me a dream last night, and I don't put a lot of stock in dreams often, but this one troubled me. And it troubled me pretty deeply to the point that um, I had to get up and pray and seek the face of God. And the Lord gave me to understand what, what it was about. Um, and I, I'll share the dream with you, and then we'll go into the scripture. Um, in the dream, there was so many different things going on um, around me, so, different, so many different people um, doing different things, saying different things. And in the dream, I knew within myself that what was being done and what was being said was not of God. And it wasn't necessarily church uh, as far as services. Um, it was ideas that people were starting to come up with in their own minds. Um, and, and it was people within our church. And I don't think it really had to do with the people. I prayed about that. I don't think it was specific to the people. I just think it was the Lord letting us know um, that it could even come us if we're not careful. Um, not only that, there were decisions being made in people's lives, and I was saying, oh, no, don't go there. No, don't do that. No, please don't say that. No, please don't think that. And the more that I was pleading with the people, people began to laugh. And it wasn't like a making fun of laugh. It was a demonic laugh. And it was a laugh to distract from what I was saying to them. And I couldn't figure out. I kept saying, why are you laughing? Stop laughing. What are you doing laughing at me? Why are you laughing? What, this isn't funny. There's nothing funny about that. And then the Lord spoke to me in the dream by a voice and said, that's demonic. And I began to realize that people had become so convinced within their own hearts and minds that there was no preaching of the word going to change them. They had given themselves over so much in their minds to the enemy that no matter how much I pled with them, they were not changing their minds. And the Lord kept saying, say it anyways. And I kept saying in my mind, Lord, they're not listening. He said, kept saying it anyways. And I kept saying it over and over again. And nothing was changing. And the laugh became more loud and more sinister to the point that it drowned out my voice. And I woke up and I was very disturbed by that dream because I thought, Lord, what in the world is this all about? But that is exactly the culture that we are in. Not only within the world, but also within the church. That the voice of the word of God is being drowned out in people's lives. Because of the enticement of the enemy. Because the enemy is holding things out to our lives. And I want to talk about that tonight. Because this world and even the church is now going to the place where the word of God is ineffectual to them. They, they, even the church has, has gone so far. And, and this is the reason why, saints of God, we can never, ever ignore uh, one of the profound purposes that God has put on this church, and that is just to declare the truth. And, and I, I, was, I was talking with the brothers last night, and a lot of people bring up, well, you know, Jesus said, you know, to the people that 
to the men that were casting out the devils when the, when the disciples said, Lord, forbid them. They said, oh, leave him alone. He who is not against us is for us. But one thing you never read is Christ never makes them his disciples. He never gives them the keys to the kingdom. If you read in the context, he's just saying, we have so many already against us. They're at least not opposing us. Don't start anything. Just leave them be. He wasn't affirming what they were doing. Because he said of his own mouth, if any man will, be, will come after me, if anyone wants to be my disciple, he has to first deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. So the Lord wasn't affirming the, 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 the ministry of those people who were casting out those devils. He was just saying, don't start, don't stir the pot here. At least they're not trying to kill us. At least they're not persecuting us. Leave them alone. And I think that sometimes the enemy has so twisted and misconstrued the word of God to the people of God that it's becoming hard when you start talking about truth even in circles that once loved truth, you start getting pushback from them because they're like, well, everybody believes in Jesus. Well, what does it matter as long as they believe in Jesus? Well, Jesus said, you, you believe there's one God and you're doing well. That's what the scripture says. It says even the devils believe and they tremble. But that doesn't mean that they're going to be in the first resurrection. It doesn't mean they're going to be a part of the kingdom of God. Truth matters so much. In fact, the word of God is the great divider. It's not the great unifier. A lot of people want to take the word of God and make it a, a book of unity. It's not a book of unity. It's actually a book of division. Jesus said, think not that I've come to bring peace. I came with a sword. And this sword is going to set at a, 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 a variance between mother and, father, mother and daughter, father and son, mother-in-law and daughter-in-law. This is going to cause a division. So don't think that I've come to bring unity. And if, if, you, if we're not careful, we'll capture the culture of this world that's trying to make Jesus the great unifier. When really, Jesus came to separate the sheep from the goats. Amen. He came to separate the wheat from the tares. We can't do that, of course. We're not wise enough. But the word of God does the work. I take you back to when Nehemiah was building the wall. And, and the wall had been finished and Ezra stood upon a pulpit of wood and he began to read from the word of God. And instinctively, the heathen separated themselves from the people of God because the word of God only applies to the children of God. The word of God only applies to the saints of God. And so we can't just take this Jesus and make him okay with everything, acceptable, uh, make him acceptable with everything, make, make everything okay, and it's, it's fine. And that's what, this, that's what the world is trying to do, and that's what the religious world is trying to do to us. And, and they're, they're using splash words like bigotry and hater and all of these things to try to intimidate us. But it's not about us showing that we're bad enough to take it. It's not about us showing that we are tough enough to take it. It is saints of God about us knowing that this is the only word of God that can save the very soul of humanity. And if we deviate from this word, then no one can be saved. And that's the reason why the Bible said, save those days, be cut short. No flesh is going to be saved. Jesus even questioned it himself. He said, when the Son of Man returns, shall he even find faith left on the earth? So we as children of God have to love this word. And we have to love the truth. And we have to love what we know. And it is time for us to stop being embarrassed and ashamed of what God has given to us. It should be precious to us. Job said, I accounted his word more necessary than daily bread. I'd rather read his word than eat. If it came between me eating at dinner and me reading his word, I'd rather have his word. Because man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. 
we have hope that even the church world doesn't have. I, I sent, uh, I sent uh, some of the brothers today, I sent them a, a, a message. And, and I, was, I was using the scripture where Jesus went to Gadara. And, 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 and he, the man, of course, full of the demons, came and ran to him and fell down. And they said, Jesus, thou son of the most high God. And I said, brothers... I said, even the devils have a greater revelation of what Jesus, who Jesus really is than most Christians do. This is truth. The truth that anchors us, the truth upon which the church is built, is not a fallacy of some Catholic dogma. It is that Jesus Christ is the son of the living God. Jesus said, who do you say I am? And they all called him one of the prophets or even John the Baptist. And Jesus said, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, thou art the Christ. You are the son of the living God. And Jesus said, blessed are you. The same terminology that the devils used to Jesus. Peter called him. Thou art the son of the living God. And Jesus said, blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonas. Flesh and blood has not revealed this unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. So does it matter how we see Jesus? Of course it does. Because the Father revealed to Peter that Jesus was the Son of God. He wasn't God himself. He wasn't the one true God. He wasn't a third person amongst the one true God. He was the Son of the living God. The firstborn of every creature. The beginning of the creation of God. And, and Jesus said upon that rock that I am the son of God. Upon that rock will I build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And so this so matters, saints. It, it matters. It, it has to matter. If it didn't matter, he wouldn't have written it down. If all he required of us was to know his name. He would have had verses that declared his name and that was it. But he gave us 66 books filled with the knowledge of God, filled with the knowledge of the Son of God, filled with the knowledge of the hope of the kingdom of God. Jesus spent the greatest majority of his ministry saying the kingdom of heaven is alike. We, does it matter? Yes, it matters. Because how can you prepare for something you don't even believe is coming? If you think we're in the kingdom right now, you'll never prepare for what is to come. And Paul, would, would not have Paul revealed that to us? But he said, if in this life only I have hope in Christ, I am of all men most miserable. He said, this is not what I'm looking for. This is not it. I would be most miserable. If this is the kingdom, we're all we're all saints of God, miserable people. If this is the bottom line of it all, we are all miserable people. But Paul said, I'm reaching. I'm pressing toward the mark of the prize of the high calling in Christ Jesus. He said, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Do you not see that that was what kept Paul in check? That's why he brought his body under subjection. That's why he wouldn't let himself go into in heresy and apostasy, rebellion and iniquity. It is because of the resurrection. It was that hope of the resurrection that held on to him no matter what was trying to pull him away. He was like, no. He was like, no, I can't all that but tongue. No, 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 Satan. You can't bring the world to me. You can't bring wealth to me. You can't bring influence to me. You can't bring any of this stuff to me. Fame, fortune, it means nothing to me. Me. I counted all that but dung. I had all that before I came to Christ. I had every bit of that. I was famous. I had I had wealth. I was I was of the upper echelon of the religious society. But when I came to Jesus, I counted it all but dung that I might win Christ. Oh, that I may know Him in the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His suffering. It mattered to Him. He was willing to die. When the Pharisees and the, the Sadducees would set upon him to kill him, he said, "Men and brethren," he said, "You Pharisees of who I am." He said, "I stand in question today concerning the doctrine of the resurrection." 
And they began to fight with each other and he escaped. But he was willing to die for it. He was willing to give everything for it. And they mocked him and ridiculed him, hated him and persecuted him, but he was willing to take it. He was willing to take it. And so, why should we count it so worthless? Why should we count it with such little value? No, you can't just go to any church. And no, you can't just hear anything. And no, it's not just okay. The truth will be the truth no matter what. And I have went into places that didn't believe like I did, but with the understanding that God was going to open the door for me to tell them. Because this is the truth. And that's the truth. It is absolute truth. And so what do we do? What do we do? Do we allow that spirit of compromise to come into us and laugh off? Laugh off? I can't tell you how violent. It, it, it shook me to my very core. I woke up out of my sleep because it was so sinister. And I knew it was a demon in those people that were laughing. And that demon kept laughing louder and louder because it did not want that person to hear the word of the Lord. Every time we reject every time we reject the word of God, we have done just that. Every time we diminish the word of God to make it okay. We have done just that. We have done just that. Every time we have every time we have deluded our our doctrines to appease the people around us, we've done just that. That's compromising. That's compromising my spirit. That's compromising my heart. Now I'm not telling you to go out and browbeat everybody with it. You've got to you've got to pray for a door of utterance. You've got to pray for that. God will give it to you. But to, to make less of what God has given to me so precious so that you are not offended, I can't do that because the word of God is too precious to me. So let's talk about this. And I want to talk to you tonight from this subject to the next step. And I want you to go to Samuel, 2 Samuel, the 5th chapter and the 17th verse. Because this is so important to us saints. And you may think right now, I feel like I'm okay right now. I feel like there's no compromise in my life. I feel like I'm all right. But I don't know about the next step. There's no temptation overtaking you, but such is common to man. But the Bible said God will with the temptation. He's going to make a way for your escape so that you can bear it. And so, so what's the next step? What do we do with the next step? And, and, and this is about David, and he's been king. He's been crowned king. And I want, I want to talk to you just for a minute before I get there. We know that David was anointed by Samuel, right? Samuel came and he anointed David. But you know that was not the only time David was ever anointed? When David went to Judah, the elders of Judah came and anointed him and set, them, set him over them. Do you know what that means? That means even though God has chosen for someone to lead his people, the people, the people, have to, in their hearts, accept that leadership. Do you know that he was not just anointed in Judah? He was anointed also after Ishbosheth died. They brought him, the elders of Israel brought him, and then the elders of Israel anointed him king over all of Israel. Seven years Judah received him. Seven years Israel rejected him. But after the death of Ishbosheth, for 30, 33 years, because he reigned for 40, 33 years, those people in Israel said, Lord, if you've anointed him to be our king, then we will receive him as our king. See, a lot of times, the reason why ministry is ineffectual in our hearts is not because God has not anointed that person. It's because we have not. God anoints them. But we don't. We don't say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the leadership you've given to us. Thank you. I received that leadership in my life. Read, the, read it. It wasn't just Samuel that anointed him. God anointed him by Samuel. But then the people had to say, we receive him, Lord. And when God puts godly, anointed leadership into your life, he's not going to force you to follow them. You're going to have to anoint that in your heart and say, Lord, I received that leadership in my life. 
And the problem is, is most people don't want to anoint a leader in their life because they want to be the leader. And the Lord spoke to me yesterday in my time of prayer. He said, zero accountability equals 100% liability. Amen. And we, we've come into a generation where the only people that church people want to hold accountable is the preachers. But they don't want to be held accountable themselves. There has to be an anointing. God, God, put them in my heart. Lord, you've given us the leadership. Now put that in our heart. And I'm hoping other churches are watching right now or will watch. Because the battle that I see going on in many churches has to come to an end. Because the people have not anointed that person in their heart. God, I receive that as the leader that you have given to us. You've anointed them. The anointing is there. Now, God, I put that in my heart as well. I receive that in my heart. So the Philistines hear that David has been anointed. In verse 17 of 2 Samuel 5, and this is a very familiar text. You, you all are going to know this text. And it says, but when the Philistines heard that they had anointed David king over Israel, and all the Philistines came to seek David, and David heard of it, and went down to the hold. He went down to a stronghold. He had a garrison that he went down. And the Bible said the Philistines also came and spread uh, themselves in the valley of Rephaim. And David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go up to the Philistines? Wilt thou deliver them into my hand? And the Lord said unto David, Go up, for I will doubtless deliver the Philistines in thy hand. He said, David, go up. Go up. Now, the, 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 the initial name of this valley means the land of giants. But David changes the name because of the move of God that takes place there. And the Bible said, and David came to Belperazim, which means a breakthrough, is ultimately what it means. It means God has made a breakthrough. Amen. Glory to God. I think sometimes that, that, that touched me so powerfully right there because I thought, Lord, maybe we're not renaming the places of of, 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 your, of, your, of your miraculous hand in our life. We keep going back to it as the land of giants when really we, God got us victory there. We keep going back to the place of our suffering and we name it after our suffering. We name it after our fear. We name it after our frustration rather than saying the Lord delivered me there. Give it another name, saints of God. Quit revisiting it as if it was a place of horror in your life and start revisiting as a place of victory in your life because if the devil could have, he'd have destroyed you right there. But you saw God's... Oh God, I so David said, this is no longer the land of giants. This is the land of which God has made a breakthrough. And he said, and David smote them there and said, the Lord hath broken forth upon mine enemies before me as the breach of waters. Therefore, he called the name of that place, Bel Perizim. God has made a breakthrough. Whew. I want you to go back and rename some places in your life. Because that's how the enemy torments us, doesn't he? Have you, have you ever had the enemy just keep taking you back to a place? Keep taking you back to a place? And, and, and if you'll notice, he never, ever, ever reminds you that God brought you through it. They were singing, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Well, 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 he got through it because God was with him. His rod and his staff, he comforted him. Instead of, instead of that, he just focuses on the valley of the shadow of death. And don't you know how much you suffered there? Man, do you remember how bad it was there? You just need to tell the devil, I, I do remember that. But I also remember that God was my shield and my buckler there. I remember that God was my help there. I remember that God was a very help in the present time, in the, in the, in a very help, present help in the time of my trouble there. I remember that it was God, had it not been for the Lord who was on my side, I would have been swallowed up. But by my God, I have run through the troop, and by my God, I have leaped over a wall. There are times you need to rename the places of your struggle because you did not die there. The enemy didn't take you out there. There. you're still in the house of God you're still singing praises to his name you're still loving the word of God rename that place Hallelujah! rename it for the victory not for the battle and there they let their images and David and his men burn them I don't even have time to get go there I don't saints because this was not like Achan David didn't take the vessels of idolatry into his. He said, we're burning these here. These are going nowhere. It's done. We got the victory. 
That's going to die. I'll, I'll preach that at another time. But he said, and the Philistines came up yet again and spread themselves in the land of Rephaim. And when David inquired of the Lord, he said, thou shalt not go up. He said, look, David, don't go up this time. Number one, David inquired of the Lord. What a novel idea. What a great idea. I don't even know how many Christians are actually talking to God about their decisions. I was thinking about that, of that, of that dream last night. Because it was just like, no, wait, no, 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 this is not, no, you can't say that. No, don't go here. No, don't do that. No, 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 no. And I was crying out to them. I, I, was, I was pleading. And they just laughed it off. Most of God's people are not inquiring of the Lord. It's mine and I want it now. But James said, say not that I will go here and I will do this. But rather say, if the Lord wills, I will. And our inquiring must be honest. What do you mean by that? Honest inquiry of the Lord begins with zero predetermined expectation of outcome. Oh, because I don't know how many people ask the Lord as to how many people give orders to the Lord. It's like driving up to Burger King and telling the Lord, this is what I want and this is how I want it. And then expecting it to come when you pull up to the window. But that is not how the Lord works. Honest inquire of the, of, of the Lord is just, Lord, I'm not going to predetermine my, uh, the, uh, the outcome here. I'm going to honestly ask you, and then I'm going to wait for the answer. I don't know very many Christians that are doing that anymore. At all. Because we want what we want. We're in an entitled society. We want it right now. We want it right now. I want it this way, this way. Uh, when we were going through that last week, I was, I was talking with Terry through it, and, and she just kept saying, more or less, get out of your vain imaginations. What she was telling me is, quit trying to imagine how it should happen. Just take it to the Lord and leave it there. Amen. It took me about five days, but I got there. I got to the point, I was like, Lord, I don't know how you're going to do this. And I don't know when you're going to do this. All I know is what you have said. And I'm just going to leave it there. I'm, you all know how, how, do you ever, does your mind ever go crazy with you when you're going through a time of trouble or a time of confusion? And all of a sudden you start developing all the scenarios and you start figuring out all of the outcomes. That is confusion. It's of the devil. God doesn't want that in our hearts. His thoughts are not our thoughts. His ways are not our ways. You can try to figure it out. You can implement all of the strategies you want. But I'm telling you, child of God, the only way for us to be safe is to inquire honestly of the Lord and say, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, and thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. No, no predetermined outcome. So take, for instance, you want this car. You want the car, man. I want this car. I want this car. I want, I'm going to have this car. And so you go to the Lord and you say, Lord, I want this car. The name it and claim it, blab it and grab it generation. I want this car, and that's my car, and I'm going to get this car. I'm going to have that car, and I don't care what anybody says. This is my car. God, give me the car. God, give me the car. God, give me the car. God will give you the car, and it will be a lemon when you take hold of it because you didn't ask. You didn't give an honest inquiry of the Lord saying, Lord, is this really your will? And, Lord, instead of me, see, the first time David said, Lord, shall I pursue them? And the Lord said, go ahead. The second time David said, Lord, shall I pursue them? And the Lord says, no. Amen. If we're not careful, when we have a predetermined expectation of outcome, our will will always supersede God's will. We will make it be God's will no matter how much we have to put forth our own human energy to make it happen. It will be God's will. And when it happens, we'll go around telling everybody if it wasn't God's will, he'd have stopped it. That's not true. Because there were times that it was not God's will and they went anyways and they were destroyed. If they weren't destroyed, they were at best diminished. So it's not about me 
saying, Lord, this is what I want and this is how I want it done. It is about me saying, Lord, I have no clue what your plans are for me. The only thing that I do know is that you have planned for me. And your plan is to prosper me, not to harm me, and to give me hope in the future. Outside of that, I don't know specifically what you're going to do in my life. So, Lord, instead of me predetermining the outcome and then taking that to you. The Lord is not a waiter up there saying, you've looked at the menu? Oh, yeah, you ready to order? Oh, yeah. Well, how, what would you like? I, well, I want a steak. Well, how would you like that steak done? Well, I want it medium. Okay. Would you like a baked potato or fries? Oh, I want a baked potato. Would you like butter and sour? That is not how the Lord works. He's not, he's not taking the orders. He's giving the orders. And so when David comes to me, he says, Lord, can I go after him? And the Lord says, no. No, not this time. Give, David gives, gets a yes the first time, a no the second time. And we must never assume God's response based upon how he has answered it before. Can't do it. Why? Because we're not inquiring of him. We're just saying, well, God, you answered it like this before. That's how you're going to answer it now. Honest inquiry. Lord, shall I go after him? No. No. And everybody say we have to take no for an answer. <laughs> we have to take, sometimes you just got to take no for an answer. I know we don't like it. I don't like it. I was, I was when, when things were happening last week, I was sitting there, I was on this altar every single day, tears pouring down my face, praying in the spirit, saying, God, please do it this way. Please, God, let it happen this way. And God said no. You remember when David sinned, committed adultery with Bathsheba? After their first son was weaned, he died. David goes out in sackcloth, sackcloth and ashes, and he's beseeching the Lord for the life of the child. They come to him and say, the boy's dead. The boy is dead. And David knew the answer is no. See, a lot of times we say, God, you're not answering our prayer because he's not giving us the answer we're looking for. Sometimes no is the best answer you'll ever get. Because if he says yes, it's going to destroy your faith. It's going to destroy your anointing. It's going to destroy your, it's going to destroy your, your appreciation of him. It's going to take your praise away. And so David says, shall I go? The Lord said no. And, and, and David didn't say, well, Lord, the last time, he accepted the answer. He accepted the answer. What do you think would have happened to David after God said no, he still pursued them? David's dead. You think that David is that God's gonna have God's gonna kill Saul over disobedience and then keep David alive? He said, I am God and I change not. Same yesterday, today, and forever. Had David not followed specifically the instruction of the Lord in each situation, it would have ended in his destruction. Let's talk about that first Kings 13 and verse 11. I'm telling you, saints, it is so important. I, that dream so shook me last night because I thought, Lord, I, I'm just a man too. And if I'm not careful, I'm going to get in that same frame of mind and I'm going to pursue what I want without saying, Lord, shall we pursue? I'm going to go after what I want without saying, Lord, shall I pursue it? Should I go after it? I've got to be able to seek the will of God as well. But here in 1 Kings 13 and verse 11, now dwelt an old prophet in Bethel. And his sons came and told him all the works that the man of God had done that day in Bethel. The words which he had spoken unto the king, them they told also to their father. And their father said unto them, what way went he? For his sons had seen what way the man of God went, which came from Judah. This guy had done incredible things for the Lord. This was a powerful man of God he's talking about here. And he said unto his son, saddle me the ass. So they saddled him the ass and he rode thereon and went after the man of God and found him sitting under an oak. Number one, he had done great works in Bethel. Number two, he is defined in the word of God as a man of God. This is not some heathen. This is a man of God 
who God had just used to do great things. And he said unto him, Art thou the man of God that came from Judah? And he said, I am. Then he said unto him, Come home with me and eat bread. Sounds okay. I mean, come on. God, what is wrong with this? What is wrong? It's, it looks good. It looks fine. I mean, what's wrong? How could it be wrong? And he said, no, 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 no. I, I can't return with you. Nor can I go in your house. I just can't. Neither will I eat bread nor drink water with thee in this place. For it was said to me by the word of the Lord. Thou shalt eat no bread nor drink water there nor turn again to go by the way that thou camest. He said, look, you cannot stay here. When, when you are in this city, don't you take water. Don't you take bread. I'm, so here we go. A man of God who had done great things for God who also heard the word of God. But an old prophet comes to him. That's the reason why you have to be careful who you counsel with. You have to be careful who you talk to. Because don't you think for a moment that maybe the person you're counseling with is not the test. I I was watching a, a little documentary on Jeremiah the other day. My goodness what he suffered. And there was always somebody there. to say, oh no, I've heard the word of God. No, I've got, and it was always to the benefit of the people. Always. And this man said, I heard God tell me, and I can't, I can't do this. Keep going. He said unto him, I am a prophet also, as thou art. And see, this, I'm, I'm telling you, saints, be careful. Be real careful. Be real careful. Be real careful. Thank God that there wasn't a prophet come to David and say, David, I've heard from the Lord. He said, go ahead and go after him. Thank God that David stuck with the word of God because this guy didn't because he talked to a, uh, he talked to a test. He talked to a test. He said, I am a prophet also as thou art. And an angel spake unto me by the word of the Lord, saying, Bring him back with thee into thine house, that he may eat bread and drink water. But he lied unto him. And that's the reason why Paul said, Though we, or an angel from heaven, preach unto you any other gospel, except that which you have received already from us, let him be cursed. This man said, An angel comes to me and tells me, You can come and eat and drink. But he lied to him. And the Bible said here, he said, so he went back with him. He he disobeyed the word of God because he believed a lie. What is wrong? This man had just done incredible things in Bethel. He's sitting underneath an oak tree. He's probably hungry and thirsty. And this old prophet comes out to him and says, ah, an angel came to me and said, it's okay. Go ahead and do it. But God had already said no. He already said no. But there's always going to be a lion prophet in your life. And you've got to know this deep down in your spirit. You don't know how many men have come come to me in my life and lied to me. And I knew they were lying. And I just stuck with the word of God. It sounded good. It looked good. How could it have been wrong? But I knew what God had told me. I knew the truth that God had put in my heart. I knew the word that God had deposited in my spirit. And I wasn't about to let a lying prophet come to me and take it out of my heart. And that's the reason I'm telling you, be careful. Be careful. Because there's always a lying prophet. There's always somebody that the enemy will send or God will send as a test to you. And they'll lie to you. And you better stand on the word of God and say, no, God said no. God said no, and that's where I'm at. Yeah, but how could it be wrong? I mean, really, it looks great. What? No, God said no. And in that dream, I was saying, no, and they were laughing. <laughs> they just kept, no, <laughs> they wouldn't listen to me. So the, the voice became, the, the laughs became so loud that no longer was the word of God effective because they couldn't hear it. And I'm going to tell you something, saints, if we're not careful, if we have not already, We're going to open up demonic activity into our lives. 
and demon demonic activity in our homes. And the sinister voice of that activity is going to become so loud it's going to drown out the word of God in our hearts. There's a lion prophet after you. If you belong to the Lord, there's a lion prophet after you. There's somebody coming to derail what God has given, the word that God has given to you in your heart. And I don't know how many Christians I hear now that, that have heard the truth and loved the truth. Now they look at me and say, it doesn't matter. Why? Because a lion prophet came. A lion prophet came, took it out of their hearts. Didn't Jesus warn us of this? He said, you better be careful when the seed is sown because the fowls of the air will come and pluck the seed. Don't you know the enemy wants to come and pluck the seed of God's word out of your heart? He wants to pluck every promise, every understanding, every truth, every wisdom, every experience, all the knowledge. He wants to come in and take it out of your heart because if he can take all of that out of your heart, he has, he has disabled you because if the foundation be destroyed, what shall the righteous do? Well, what foundation? The Bible said we are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself, the chief cornerstone. So if he can diminish the word of God in our hearts and if he can diminish what God has spoken to us, if he can do all of that, he dissettles us. And now we can no longer where we used to just be solid. I know where I am. I know what I believe. I love the word of God. I love the truth. I don't know. I mean, does it really? I mean, because somewhere along the line, we've let compromise into our spirit and the fowl of the air came and plucked the seed out of our heart. Hallelujah. But the Bible told me to love the truth so much that I buy it and I don't sell it out for nobody. Some of us have paid a heavy price to purchase what we have. We went through hell and high water, and we held on when other people let go. And I refuse to have paid such a great price for what I have to just sell it out to make other people comfortable or to make me okay with what I want to do. No, if God has spoken to me, that settles it. I'm good. I'm okay. I'm right. I, 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 it's all right with me because I want to be in the will of God. And the Bible said, he goes back. He had just, he had not let him take that word out of his heart. I've watched people leave this church. I saw a family walking out of this church and I said, God told me that they were leaving. And I, I approached the husband. I'll never forget it in one service. And I pulled him off to the side and I said, I'm going to tell you this is what's going to happen if you leave this place. He got so angry at me, he got in his car and Peeled out of the parking lot. It was not long, and everything that I told him would happen happened to them, happened to his family. Don't you ever, don't you ever negate the power of the word of God. Don't you ever let the enemy cause you to diminish the voice of God in your life. Don't you ever let, don't you ever allow the enemy when God has put a prophet in your life to speak the word of God into your heart. Don't you ever allow the enemy to cause you to him to him to be so diminished in your spirit that when he gives instruction, we just laugh it off. What is he now? <laughs> That's a demon working in your spirit. There's a demonic influence in your heart trying to take everything away from you that God ever gave to you. Hold on, child of God. I mean, hold on with everything you have and don't you ever let a lion prophet come and take that away from you. Verse 19, maybe 20. And it came to pass as they sat at the table. The old prophet couldn't lie now. But the young prophet couldn't escape. I'll say that to you again. The old prophet couldn't lie now. But also, the young prophet couldn't escape that's the danger territory because you believe a lion prophet and it doesn't have to be flesh and blood <laughs> it could be a lion spirit come upon you you believe a lion prophet you take you take ungodly counsel and i'll never again understand why people counsel with worldly people 
when it comes to matters of their life, when they are in the church and they have access to the word of God, the spirit of God, prayer, the ministry, I will never understand it other than they know what the truth is and they don't want to hear it. Hear the word of the Lord, the spirit of God sits on this prophet that had just lied, had just lied. The word of God comes up out of him. He said, and he cried unto him, and the man of God that came from Judah, saying, Thus saith the Lord, for as much as thou hast disobeyed the mouth of the Lord, and hast not com- kept the commandment which the Lord thy God commanded thee. Keep going. But camest back and has eaten bread and drunk water in the place of the which the Lord did say to thee, eat no bread and drink no water because you disobeyed the no. Thy carcass shall not come unto the sepulcher of thy fathers. He said, you're not even going to make it home. This is what's dangerous. When you let a lion prophet get into your spirit, whether it's a man or a spirit, because there's going to come a point that the lie can no longer be held. And the Lord is going to come and deal with the fact that we did not hold on to the word that he had already spoken to us. And by the time that happens, there is no escape for us. He said, you're not even going to get home. And it came to pass after he had eaten bread and after he had drunk that he saddled for him the ass to wit for the prophet whom he had brought back. And when he was gone, a lion met him, by the way, and slew him. And his carcass was cast in the way. And the ass stood by it, and the lion also stood by the carcass. And the lion did not eat the carcass. Guess who sent the lion? God sent the lion. God sent the lion. A man of God, done great things for God, had heard the word of God, believed a lion prophet, and could not escape his own destruction because he didn't hold on to the word that was already spoken. And the lion stood there. And the the, 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 the man's donkey just stood there right by the carcass until the old prophet came and took that man of God and buried him in his own grave. My God, saints, this was written for our learning. This was written so we would learn. This was not written so that we could just say, man, these are good stories in the Old Testament. This was written to tell us if you ever... Let a lie come into your life. If you ever let the enemy take the word that God had given to you out of your heart, the lie will not be able to persist forever. The Bible said sin is pleasure for a season. And it also says because God's judgments are not executed speedily, men's hearts are hardened. Well, if God cared about it, why didn't he do something about it now? Well, if it was that big of a deal, God would have already done something. No, no, God didn't strike the man dead when he was on his way to the prophet's house. He didn't even strike him dead when he was sitting down at the table. He didn't strike him dead when he ate the bread. He didn't strike him dead when he drank the water. He died on his way back home. God didn't kill him right away. But his destruction was already settled. And this is the reason why I don't let spirits get into your life. Don't let demonic powers come into your life to cause you to laugh off what God has spoken to you. Why? Because the lie can't hold out forever. At some point, the truth is going to come forth. And save for a great merciful move of God in your life. You may never make it back home ever again. So going back to David. What if David had disobeyed? What if he had let a lie come into his heart? He said, I'm inquiring of the Lord honestly. And whatever answer the Lord gives, I'll take it. I mean, 
Can you imagine? You know what the Lord told him to do? He said, go behind them and set a compass about them. In other words, put a half circle around them. But the Lord said, last time, last time, you moved at my word. Now I want you to wait for me. I love this. Oh, my gosh. Because he said, when you hear the rustling or the moving of the sound in the mulberry tree, And you have to understand, a mulberry tree is not a little bitty plant. A mulberry tree is over 40 feet tall. (laughs) So the Lord is saying, when you hear the rustling in the top of the mulberry trees, you're going to know that there's no man going before you. But he said, I will go before you. He said, in other words, David, wait till I move. And when you hear me move, you move. And what did God do for him? They chased them hundreds of of, of yards away from Israel, miles away from Israel, all the way uh, from Geba until Gezer. I mean, we're talking, they chased them to where they were no longer a threat unto Israel. The Lord said, I am going to fight with you today because he obeyed the word of God the Lord. I don't have time for all of this. But what God showed David is if you'll just obey my word. Somebody said, well, when am I going to get mine? Don't worry about it. Just know you're going to get it. He said, be not weary in well-doing. For in due season, you reap if you don't faint. He said, in other words, I'll give it to you if you, don't, if you don't quit. You don't throw in the towel. You'll get what's coming to you. But we don't know when due season is. Due season is not always uh, 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 the same for each of us. Due season is due season. That means when God deems it's the right time. Until then, you know what David did? He went down into the stronghold. He went down there and he inquired of the Lord. He said, oh, Lord. I'm going down into the hold. That's what the hold is. It's just an abbreviation of the stronghold. He went down and he inquired of the Lord. Saints of God, we have to stop. We have to stop being so, I don't want to say it. We have to stop being so busy. And that's why, as Terry dealt with me, Jared, turn off your vain imagination. Turn it off. Because vain imagination doesn't necessarily have to be immoral. Vain imagination is just trying to think that God thinks like me. That what I think is what God has to be thinking. The way I think it should work out is the way God has to work it out. That's a vain imagination. Because his thoughts are as far from mine as the heavens are above the earth. How can I even? That's like going up into heaven and bringing God down to me. I, I can't afford for God to be a human. Thank God God is not like me. Thank God God is not equal to me. Thank God that God doesn't think like me. It has been his greatness. It has been his omnipotence. It has been his omniscience and it has been his omnipresence that has brought me through many battles in my life that if I would have gotten my way, I would have destroyed myself. Sometimes we need to stop and relax. I mean, sometimes we need to chill out. We're so, uh, it's got to happen, 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 got to happen. God says, no. When you hear. No, 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 no. Not when you want it, but when you hear. The rustling in the mulberry tree. Not because you you want it done right now, not because you want to believe that. No, no, no. But when you hear. See, it, we're so busy speaking to him, we're not taking time to hear. We're so busy telling him how we want it to work out. We're too busy to hear how he's going to work it out. We're, we're, we're so focused on the adversary in front of us. That we're not even listening for the word of the Lord. And the word of the Lord says when you hear the rustling, the moving in the top of the mulberry trees, 
You'll know that's not a human army. You'll know that that is not an army of flesh and blood. These trees are 40 foot tall, David. So you will know that's an angelic host that is coming through the top of the mulberry trees. And when you hear it, come on down, we'll fight together. And God gave them another great victory. Amen. And that's the reason why the Bible says, in patience possess ye your souls. Patient. Patiently waiting. Patiently enduring. Patiently working. It's patient. I don't know how God's going to work out all the stuff I need him to work out in my life. I don't know when, how, or what. All I know is that he's got to do it. And until he says something different, I'm going to follow what he says. And I'm never, ever going, when, 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 when I had that dream last night and then I came upon this story, I thought, Lord, don't ever let me ever again come to you with my opinion. Let me just come with an honest inquiry. Lord, what do you want me to do? And if I don't like it, I'll still stand by your word. If, 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 if it's not what I wanted to hear, I'll still stand by your word. Because at the end of the day, the enemy's going to entice us with everything he can get, throw at us to try to take everything that we are away from us. Don't think that the alphabet community ain't going to try to take sexual morality away from us. They're going to take it away. They're going to try. They're going to do everything in their power to entice. I, I think Sister Michaela shared a, a video of Bodie Bauckham. And he said, before I get into this message, I, I want you to know that I love wife beaters. And I have friends that are wife beaters. I mean, some of my favorite people beat their wife. And, and I'm sure everybody around him was like, he was like, but that's the same thing preachers are doing when they go to talk about homosexuality. They stand there for the first 15 minutes of the message, qualifying why they're about to talk about it, and then the very end of the message, apologizing for having to talk about it. Man, that was so powerful to me. I thought, you're not wrong. You're not wrong. If I, if I, I mean, what, what would you do if I came in here and said that stuff? Some of my best friends are killers. I love them guys. Now, they shouldn't do it, but man, some of my best friends. We're like, Pastor, you're crazy. The Bible says you don't have fellowship with unfruitful workers of, of darkness. But I thought, God, help us to not change. The devil's going to come to us and say, doesn't matter where you go to church. As long as you go to church. But what are they talking about there? Do you think Paul would have been okay with the saints going to the church of Hymenaeus and Philetus? He rebuked them sharply. He wouldn't have been okay with that. Do you think that you think that John, the beloved, would have been okay with the saints going down to the church of Nicolaitans? No. No, it didn't matter if they said, oh, we believe in Jesus, but we're also sexually immoral, and we see that as a worship to Jesus. That's what the Nicolaitans were. The, the Gnostics, oh, the more sinful we appear, the greater great God's grace looks. You think they would have been okay with them going down there? No. Because those, those preachers were sent to rip the word of God out of their well, we can just go anywhere as long as they're claiming Jesus. No, we go back to Catholicism because they say the name of Jesus. Go there and worship with them. Doesn't matter that it's the harlot church. Doesn't matter that the Jesus they, they talk about is not our Jesus. They say the name of Jesus. Well, they're fine. They're fine. But Paul said they preach another Jesus and they preach another gospel. A name we've not preached and a gospel you have not received. You think he would have been okay with it? Of course he wouldn't have. It matters. It don't matter what doctrine. It doesn't matter. I mean, really, doctrine. Doctrine is just divisive. My son Timothy, take heed unto thyself, into the doctrine. 
that thou mayest be able to save thyself and them that hear thee. What was he preaching? Paul said it was doctrine. It was doctrine. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for rebuke, for reproof, for doctrine, for instruction in righteousness. The man of God may be thoroughly furnished unto every good work. Every time you hear that, that's a spirit trying to pull the love for truth out of your heart and diminish it and make it as nothing. And most of the men that I hear that from can't teach it, and that's why they say it. And they're intimidated to talk to anybody that knows anything about it. Don't let it happen, saints. Hold on to everything you've got. It's going to be precious to you. It may not be precious to you now. There's coming a day, though, How do you think that young prophet felt about that word he had heard from the Lord the first time? When he got on that, when he saddled his donkey and he began to ride away, I guarantee you, he was like, God, if I had just listened, if I had just obeyed what you told me the first time, Lord, if I just heard you, if I just. But by the time the word was precious to him, it was too late. Saints of God, hold this precious in your heart. Many thousands upon thousands upon thousands of the saints have laid their lives down so that we could hear it. Let's not diminish it. Let us hold on. And I'm telling you, there's demonic activity all around us. And that activity is going to do everything in its power to make you almost disdain Scripture almost disdain the preaching of the word. We're already there. I mean, we're already there. People want to come to concerts now. Just come sing us some songs, man. Don't preach. Come on. Don't preach. I, I, have, I have friends that, I, well, acquaintances, that brag about the fact that they have, man, the greatest music, and they preach for like 10 minutes. And I'm thinking, my God, why is the word of God not precious to us? So I'm telling you, New Destiny, In that dream, there were people sitting in this room right now, people that are watching over that live stream that I was screaming at with everything I could, with all the voice I had. They were under such a delusion of a lie, such demonic possession that the demon in them was crying out so loud in laughter that that person could no longer hear the word of God. That, man, that struck fear into my heart. I thought, my God, don't let me be one. Don't let me be one, Lord, that my desires, my wants, my thoughts, my opinions, my philosophies, that they become so powerful in my life that the enemy finds a foothold there. And by the time The word of God gets to me. I am so enamored with the voice of the enemy that I can no longer hear the voice of the Lord. That is a warning to this church. That is a warning to you watching. Love the truth. Buy it. Sell it not. Hold on to the word of God. Give yourself completely to it. Don't you ever let the culture of this world, the philosophical ideology and secular humanism of this world creep into your heart to where you start calling good evil and evil good. There is a very few times in the scripture where God gives a woe to something, and that is one of them. Woe unto them that call good evil and evil good. Don't you ever let the enemy get into your home, into your households, and start diminishing the word of God Husbands, how you treat your wives. Wives, how you submit yourselves to your husbands. Parents, how you, te- how you train up your children. Don't you ever let the, the enemy get so into your spirit. And I'm telling you, if you are unhealed by childhood trauma, you've got to come and get it right with the Lord because the 
devil has a foothold in our life to try to destroy us training up our children in the way they should go. We will raise them by our wounds. We will not raise them by the word. We will make them victims. We will, I'm telling you, Saints, I've watched it over and over again in children's lives that have been in this church that are now out there running like hell because the parents refuse to raise their children by the word. They raised them and were manipulated by their wounds and they were a victim as a child so they made their children victims and now their children are out there going crazy and doing all kinds of monstrous things and will not adhere to authority and will not submit themselves to law because they're the victim. Don't do that. Don't do that. If, you're, if you've got trauma, come and get it healed. Come and get it healed because wounded people make other wounded people. Don't ever let the enemy come in. Take the word of God. I know the word of God says this, but that's not what I'm doing. Oh, young prophet. And when your children are standing before the judge, what you have heard in this sanctuary will come back flooding into your spirit. Say, oh, if I had just listened. Don't let the liar come in. Rebuke him. Rebuke him by the word. Do what Jesus did. It is written. It is written. It is written over and over again until he goes. Because if we're not careful, that dream is going to come true. That was a warning to me. I mean, I'm talking, I went to bed. I went to bed at peace last night. For the first time, we had awesome prayer last night. I mean, the, we had prayer out in the, in the, in the uh, what do you call it, the picnic pavilion, and it was incredible. You could feel the power of God all over that place. I went home. I was good. Went to bed. I mean, everything. And then all of a sudden, in the middle of the night, the Lord says, but I got to show you something. I got to show you something. Out of my sleep. Oh, God. Oh, God, don't let that happen to us. Lord, don't let that happen to us. Please, Jesus. Thank you for warning me so I can warn the saints. Don't let that happen to us. Let's love the true saints. Let's love the word of God. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. Amen. I know it's not a shouting message, but go home and chew on it. Go home and feed on it. Don't let the devil come. Don't let the liar come. Amen. And if you find yourself in a position where you are not willing to counsel with godly people, you already know the liar is there. You know the liar is there. Because the Bible says that a blessed man doesn't stand in the counsel of the ungodly. He does not. So if you're counseling worldly people, it is because you want an outcome and you know what the truth already is and you don't want to hear it. That's a demon spirit that has come into your life. You may not be possessed with it, but it's talking to you. Rebuke that liar. No, 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 no. In the multitude of counselors, there is safety. I will go counsel the word of God. I will go counsel the people of God. No, 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 no. I'm not going in that direction. No, I've heard the word of God. I know the word of God. Because as that young prophet, by the time the word of God was precious to him, it was too late. He couldn't come home. And I think that is something that should always, because we always talk about the prodigal son. But nobody hardly ever talks about the young prophet. Nobody. Prodigal son made it home. Praise God. We thank God for that. That's awesome. Actually, that whole, that whole, prod, that whole parable is actually about the older son. It's not even about really the prodigal son. It's about the older son. Jesus is dealing with the Pharisees. He's dealing with them that have been there all the time. That whole whole thing, it's wonderful that the prodigal son goes back. We're rejoicing over that. But really the story is about the older son. He got home, praise God. This guy didn't. Nobody's guaranteed to be able to. Let's just stay in the word, saints. Stay in the will of God. Amen? All right, we're going to take up our tithes, our offerings. Glory to God. Now, y'all pray for me tonight that I'll have some other crazy dream. I'm like, Lord, a little sleep, Jesus. I woke up from that thing. I could feel my heart pounding in my back. I was like, my God, help me, Jesus. But I just can remember in that dream, I was weeping and crying and yelling to the top of my lungs to the people of God. But they were so deaf to it because of the influence of the enemy, they could no longer hear it. Amen. Let's make sure our ears stay tuned to the word of God. Father, we thank you so much.
for this day. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the spirit and the anointing that we felt through the worship, God. Lord, your presence was surely here to prepare our hearts to hear the word of God tonight. I pray this goes so deeply into our spirit so that we don't ever forget this service. Lord, if they don't ever remember a sermon I ever teach the rest of my life or what I have taught, let them remember this one, oh God. Let the word of God be so precious to us. We're not willing to surrender it to anyone and for any reason. Oh God, in the name of Jesus, help us, God, to keenly, God, have the kind of discernment, Lord God, that discerns, Lord, spirits around us that are lying, oh God, even if it sounds right. Even if it sounds good, even if it pleases our mind and our flesh and our thoughts, God, help us to discern the word of the enemy from the word of God. And now, Lord, as we continue our worship and our giving, bless those that have to give. Bless them abundantly as you watch over your word to perform it concerning them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. All right, let's receive the offering of the Lord. Choice at the word of God. Remember when it was dear to you. I choose it again. 
Happy birthday to her, I see, you know, We want to pray for her. I think she's not feeling well. I think she's under the weather. We want to pray for her. Youth night will be ten, this Friday, right? This Friday at 6.30 to 9.30. Remember, uh, 12 to 18. Kids' church meeting will be Sunday, April the 23rd after the morning service. Family fun night will be April the 28th at 6.30. Women's prayer Tuesday, May the 9th at 6.30. Had an awesome men's prayer last night. I'm going to try to do that as much as we can, brothers. I know that, Brother Jonathan, we're, we're, we're looking forward to the day you can be there as well. Amen. Um, I want to pray for Sister Lindy. Continue to pray for Braxton and Victoria. Uh, please pray for my daughter Natalie and her children. Um, my mom, Riley, Brother Joe Hogan. Uh, my uncle David. Sister Lynette Joyce, talk to Sister Lynette. She's doing so much better. Um, but she's got doctor's orders and pastor's orders that she needs to continue to rest, to recover. And uh, so we're so thankful. Continue to remember Brother Joe Garrett and Sister Tracy and your prayers. This, this stuff with these cysts is just causing so many issues now. She's having low blood sugars almost every other hour. He's having to be up about every hour and a half with her. Let's just pray God's help, God's strength. Love them. I love, I love that family. I love them. just wonderful people of God, faithful saints of God. I want to continue to remember my cousin Celeste and her recovery. Braden, my nephew, Brother David Peters, Brother Denny Livingston, and then all of us allergy sufferers. Let's pray for us. Lydia needs our prayers. Yes. Yes. Anybody else? Terry, you'll be going back tomorrow. So we want to pray for Terry that God would give her traveling mercies on her way home. And she'll be back real soon because Natalie's going to have another baby real soon. And so she's got to come back and, amen, play nursemaid. <laughs> Not a bad gig, huh? Not a bad gig. All right. Well, Sister Rita, come. Let's pray for her. And then let's just pray, saints, while we're doing that for all these needs.
sings one more time. I choose you. Sunday, amen. Let's let God do his thing, all right? God bless you guys.